I think a lot of people think about suicide throughout their lifetime. I think it's much more normal than we talk about in society. I think that people go through ups and downs often and that death is something that people sometimes think about as an option, as a way out. I think that there's a lot of stigma around suicidality and around thoughts of suicide and that it's much more common and normal in people than we give it credit for. Reaching out, talking about it, giving it a voice, giving it a place is actually really powerful and that the vulnerability is powerful and that it's nothing to be ashamed of or feel guilty about. If you do reach out, there's a lot of treatment here. There's a lot of people, support, people that understand, that can value what you're going through. Research shows that we are having a significant uptick in teen suicidality and in completion in teen suicide. I think there's several factors to this. I think one is the ongoing onslaught of social media, phones, being available to get bullied or, or having social input all the time. Like teens cannot escape social media and they are so attached to their phones and to being available all the time. Their brains cannot take in that level of stimulation and they don't have the resiliency and coping skills to be able to regulate, which makes them very impulsive and irrational, and they feel like they don't have an escape often other than to complete suicide. Depression is something that most of the population will experience in some point in their life. And I think what puts depression apart from just sadness is depression is persistent. It's low mood, it's withdrawing, it's isolating, it's feeling irritable for a more extended period of time. Seeking out treatment for depression is something that I know can be really hard to do, but I would recommend seeking out treatment as early as you can. Once you start to recognize that this isn't just sadness, that it seems to be persistent, that it's starting to really negatively impact life, that you're feeling dark and like you aren't able to come back up. But I think it's something that we wanna reach out early on so that we get treatment started right away. So the signs of suicide that we want to really be looking for are tearfulness, isolation, irritation, withdrawal from activities, interests, relationships that previously the person was really invested in or brought enjoyment to their life. People may stop having future planning. So they used to say things like this summer I'm going to and now there's no talk about a future. Those can be really concerning signs of suicidality. Sometimes knowing the signs of suicidality are not enough, unfortunately. Sometimes people are very impulsive, very rash. They don't have the resiliency or coping skills to get through something that is happened that is very jarring to them, very immediate to them. Sometimes people get into treatment and where they were really, really low and suicidal but didn't have enough energy to act on it, they start to come out of that depression and that can be a really risky time for people because to the loved ones around them and the treatment team, they look like they're doing better. They're starting to be more engaged, be more active, not be flat. So we think they're getting better and coming out of the depression. They are, but they're still suicidal and end up completing. The other time that sometimes we don't see signs of suicidality is when somebody has made a decision to end their life and they are at peace with their decision. And so they actually are in good spirits. They're engaging with some loved ones, uh, knowing inside that they have a plan. And so a lot of those signs and symptoms are gone. Raising a teen, there have been times where she has said impulsively, like passive suicidal things like, I wish I wasn't here. I'm just not gonna deal with this anymore. Things that I've then had to really sit down and, and talk through and not just minimize, not pass off as wanting attention or that she doesn't really mean it because I hope she doesn't mean it, but we need to have that conversation. We need to sit down and give value to those words. It's never too late to open lines of communication 
with your adolescent or loved one. I think it starts with having a conversation around that you're there for them, that you want to listen. I think as a parent, being open to hearing things that you may not want to hear, but at the end of the day could save your teen's life is the perspective you need to come to those conversations with. The other thing I think is really important for both parents and kids is to have some common language, not just happy, sad, mad, but be able to really talk about emotions on a spectrum. When a kid says, I had a bad day, as a parent, we don't say like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, what's, what are you gonna do the rest of the afternoon? That we really dig into, it. what does a bad day look like? Or if a kiddo says, I feel mad, that we really dig into what mad is. I think mad is one of those words that we often use that is sort of an overgeneralization of a lot of feelings. And I think a lot of kiddos have this uh, predisposition to say, never mind, I'm okay, everything's fine, and kind of blow us up. And I think as parents or guardians, loved ones, we have a duty to annoy them and to dig into what they're saying because mostly kids really do want to be heard and they do want to have that relationship. And it's, it's on us as adults to, to challenge uh, their, their blow-offs and to continue to, to sit down and, and open those lines of communication.